This summer marks the second year of successful operations for the Open Cape Network, one of the region's most important new assets. Open Cape is a state-of-the-art, 100% fiber optic network providing internet infrastructure extending from Provincetown across the Cape Cod Canal to Providence and Boston. Open Cape and its operating partner, CapeNet, are both Massachusetts companies established to advance the economic, social, and public safety interests of the Cape and southeastern Massachusetts. Today we want to examine how the Open Cape Network has revolutionized the way the town of Falmouth does business. Joining us in the studio are Lynn Grant Major, the Director of Information Technology for the town of Falmouth, and Wendy Haskell, Director of Technology and Libraries for the Falmouth Public Schools. Thanks for being here today. A pleasure. Lynn, let me start with you. Why was it so important for the <laughs> town of Falmouth to get connected to the Open Cape Network? Well, our main effort uh, for years, for 30 years, has been connecting all the town buildings together um, for sharing resources and um, software, etc. And uh, we've been, we did it different ways. We did it with wireless. We did it with... Um, fire uh, alarm cable at first so that was it was huge for us when we got offered the chance to have a fiber network between our buildings that was the most important thing for us and and, and i know we've talked before about uh, the efficiency the economic viability of using this kind of a network and 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 just briefly how did you find that working uh once we were connected it was the the fastest connection we had and um reliable and uh, it made everything much much better so um, the minute it got hooked up we left it our biggest uh, thing is to connect the buildings together and once we got to one building or the other then we could go out in the internet but and that was important too but connecting our buildings to each other was the most important for us and we knew that connecting schools would be a really important component of that. And <coughs> Wendy, when you felt the, uh, when you saw the connectivity come together, what was your first impression of how this was going to change education? Uh, well, just connecting the buildings. Now we can share resources. Uh, we have opportunities to uh, streamline what we do. So we don't have to have, we have eight buildings. We don't have to have eight different servers, and we have, don't have to have eight different um, uh, backups in, in every building. We can kind of connect everybody together. We share a lot of the same applications. For example, all of our libraries, they have their circulation program. Their, uh, we, it's, we use Destiny. And so now they're all connected, and it's really fast and easy for kids to check books out. You know, they, they, they check the book out, and you know, they barcode it really fast, and it goes to the high school. That's where the server is. So um, it just has improved our efficiency as, as, as well as the town. So. And, and the town and the school are connected. So we share our financial and program. Payroll. And, and because, for example, payroll sits on a virtual server in town hall, and all the people in the school can, through the fiber, get to that server to do all their exceptions and whatnot. And... Yeah, so our, that's a good our accounting thing. package is in the cloud, so we really have to get to the internet. But that's recent. In the old days, the accounting package was on a server in town hall, and and um, very important. What was really transformative here was using the fiber optic network as opposed to the typical coax cables that the cable companies can provide. And so the bandwidth that you get with the fiber is just so much greater. I'm just curious, from the town's perspective, have you been able to see greater efficiencies in the way that work gets done? Oh, there's, there's so many things we couldn't do if we didn't have uh, the speed. Um, for example, we had to move our GIS server um, from the DPW to town hall so that in town hall they could get to it where they needed it the most, where once we have the fiber connected, uh, we can move the GIS server anywhere we want. Um, reason I mentioned GIS is that sending images and that's much more uh, bandwidth intensive than just you know streams of data so um, I would bet most people don't even anticipate the amount of data that would be transferred between municipal buildings and school buildings do you have any sense as to how that compares 
well, I will just speak for the town side. I don't think we're as, uh, for the school side, they're much, they're, they're hitting the internet all the time with huge amount of data. We, on the town side, side, the internet isn't as important as um, everybody accessing the servers that are in town hall. We've, there's a, a, not new, but a relatively new concept is virtual servers where you make multiple servers out of one group of servers, if that's the best way to say it. But once we, both the town and the school invested in that, then if you can have fast access to those central servers, you don't have to have a server at your own location. You know, for us, it's police, fire, DPW. When those servers get to end of life, we can build them into our virtual server structure and you know, don't have to buy a new server at every location. So we're passing town data more than, you know, the internet's important, but not like it is for the school. Every school student gets on the internet. Right, and so if you think about maybe the town buildings all connected with a network that right. is separate from the internet, right, but right. you need the same kind of speed and connectivity through right, all yes. those buildings at all times. Right, right? and yeah. uh, Wendy mentioned backup. Um, it's wonderful. It takes care of your off-site backup if you can, for example, on our virtual server array in the town hall, we keep our Veeam backup at the fire department, and it goes right across the fiber, and then we don't have to keep moving data off-site. That would be an example, I guess. Hmm. Now in the schools, I know that Google Classroom has become very popular since I think 2010, there are now a number of cloud-based education applications that public schools are using, but I don't know that any are doing it as well as the schools on Cape Cod as a result of connecting to Open Cape. And I just wondered, Wendy, if you could give us some examples of how that's working in the schools now. Well, uh, Falmouth has been a, a Google district for a number of years, uh, but Google Classroom actually is, is reasonably uh, new. So, but just talking about going out on the internet and all the resources that are available, oftentimes uh, when you buy a textbook or we don't even buy textbooks because it's all online, they also have, for example, at Lawrence School, we bought a new math program and there's this whole online component and, you know, they're just so excited that they have stable, steady, reliable internet so the kids now can, and we're also buying Chromebooks. We would never be able to do the Chromebook initiative that we're doing, and we're buying them for 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Students don't take them home, but they come into school, they'll pick them up, and they'll use them all day. It would be impossible to do that without having dependable Internet, because when you open up a Chromebook, you're on the Internet. Um, so, but the cu curriculum, I mean, a lot of teachers are actually, they're talking about the high school of almost uh, building their own curriculum with resources off the Internet, to support, I mean, I mean, you think about so many things are constantly changing, and to buy a textbook, it's almost like in a car, you know, you drive it off a lot and it automatically depreciates. Well, you buy a book, a history book, think about it, you know, and in a couple of years we're gonna have a new president and that won't even be mentioned. So, so having online, access to online, those kinds of resources, uh, curriculum rich resources, uh, definitely s support and uh, augment and, and, and add to the existing curriculum and to the tools that are available for teachers and makes them more efficient. They can manage, they can collaborate. There's all kinds of collaboration going on and projects and research. And I mean, it, the teachers are doing amazing things because um, they know that they can, you know. It's, they are, they're excited, you know, about the different possibilities. I learn from them all the time of the different things that they're doing. So. You know, I find that interesting because you would expect the students who've all grown up in the digital age mm. to adapt to this quickly, but I would have thought that the teachers might have been a little apprehensive about using cloud-based applications as much as they do, but it is working. Yeah, and I, well, teachers want what's best for their, their students. And so they look at them and they know that they need to have 21st century skills. The students need to have those 21st century skills to be able to compete in today's world. You know, when they, we can't even imagine the jobs that they'll have when they graduate from high school and college at this point. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, they're just, they're always growing and changing. So 
to teach kids how to research on the internet and understand the information that there's bias in information and it's, and it's some of it's just bogus, you know. Um, so those kinds of skills, I think teachers embrace it because they want the best for their kids. And family teachers definitely do that. So. I know you've told a story before about how a, a teacher happened to be online and noticed that a student was doing extra work in the evening and how gratifying that was. Well, they actually conversed with a student. So the student was working on, they had a writing assignment. And this happens frequently. One of the things that teachers talk about, the writing is so dramatically improved because of Google and the kids. Um, they, had, they can communicate with the teacher. So the teacher was online, noticed that the student was on working on their assignment and they did like a little comment, you know, well, you might want to think about being more descriptive in this part of your essay. And the, the student, you know, they conversed back and forth a little bit, and then the student went back and fixed it. And then the teacher, you know, saw them the next day and was like, oh, you know, nice job, and you made those corrections. So, um, and one of the things, the, I've had lots of teachers tell me one of the best things about Google Classroom, because it's all online, and in the cloud, students can work at home, um, and teachers don't have to take piles of papers home anymore. They take their computer home, they open it up and they can go through it and comment and they actually now you, they can, in addition to typing comments, they can actually verbally comment uh, over top of their assignments. It's a, the really co the cool tools that they Isn't have. That great. Yeah. Isn't that great? You know, Lynn, many of the towns on the Cape are connecting to the Open Cape Network, but I don't know that any town has connected to the level that Falmouth has. And I wonder, have you had the opportunity to work with any of the other towns well, on how they set up? Yes, and Falmouth was definitely first. And partly because of Huey and Art Gaylord being, you know, big in Open Cape and this is his town. So we and do you want to give a little bit of background on that, on Art Gaylord from Art, Art Woods Gaylord Hole? is the, I, I don't know if it's official title, but he's the IT director at Woods Hole Oceanographic. And he was on the board at Open Cape when it first became a concept uh, with Dan Gallagher. And right, so taking federal money that was federal part money, of the, they got, I guess, the Reinvestment Act, I think, of 2008. Forty something million, million dollars yes. came up with this uh, Open Cape. And for a while, sort of, because we met a lot with Art Gaylord, um, we believed it, and immediately we knew that we were going to get six or seven anchor institutions, part of the Open Cape initiative, mostly libraries, I think the high school and the fire department, mm -hmm. because they were emergency um, facilities. But we immediately went and got a... a an article out so that we could connect 11 more buildings, including all the schools and the admin building and um, the fire department, the police department. Uh, we expanded to the senior center and the harbor master. But we were the first town they, they actually fibered. And we have an organization called Catman, Cape Area Technical Managers, and they meet once a month at the Barnstable Complex. And we talked about that for over a year. That was one of the main subjects. Well, has it happened yet? Has Falmouth got the money yet? Have you connected any buildings yet? So we were, you know, there saying, yes, it's happening. And we loved, you know, reporting when we were the first people to connect and set up a contract with CapeNet for Internet and stuff like that. And so I think what our success, truthfully, encouraged other towns to come in right behind us. I know Mashpee used our very same concept. Um, so it was, a, it was, I think, we were, we were the first and set the stage, I think. And a model community. A mo you know. Can I and, add to that? At the, I'm sorry to interrupt, Aunt Lynn, but Barstable did uh, connect with Fiber, but they didn't use OpenCape. They, they did it all by themselves. And it was really quite the burden. I mean, I, I mean, when I talked to the tech director there, so the fact that we had Open Cape and CapeNet come in and kind of help us and support us and, and, and basically took it off of our plates and did all that work, I mean, it was just a, you know, and that the town supported the, the connections. It was, it was just such a gift, at least and compared to what Barnstable went through. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, the future... The county's trying to be more proactive in what they do for all the towns. And the, at the co-location center at Barnstable County Complex, they, are, they set up a lot of servers. And they're just starting to offer things like, you know, 
storing data or backup. Mm. Um, they set up a, sh a shared application for permitting um, that they're pushing out. Um, so, you know, there are county implications of how the the open Cape fiber can help all of us share th share things. But that's sort of a little slow to get off the ground. It, it, um, but I, th I can see it coming. And I would think, too, that as you're using it more, you're able to determine new ways of applying the, oh, yeah. the, the network There's and connecting new pieces of Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, we, we make our little joke, you know, there's the local area network and there's the wide area network, and we call ours FAN, as a joke, Falmouth Area Network, because it's that network that we started being the most important thing to us, was not really getting to the county, not getting to the internet, but getting all our buildings connected. And now going to the county and having an alternative way to get on the internet so it never fails, we have, we have two different ways to go. Um, that's like a plus now. We're going to expand other things. But the fan is what's pulled us in. And maybe the WAN is where we'll end up. And, you know, we should mention that the Open Cape Network is not for residential use, that no. currently it's set up for businesses and for large data institutions and towns, obviously. And, you know, I just wonder, from a public safety perspective, is there anything that you could address that speaks to how the network is improving public safety in the region? Well, I think, you know, the, maybe the future is more important. We're, st we're trying to do a new computer uh, a dispatch center for police and fire. And um, we, they haven't decided exactly where it's going to be and how it's going to work. But because we're sitting there with this fiber connecting all the buildings, it gives us a lot more options. You know, if you have something solid like that, you, you have choices of doing some dispatch here and some there. So when I, th I think that's... Really There's helpful. a great expectation that it will. It, I mean, it will, and I just we're uh, tomorrow. I'm meeting with the fire department on uh, looking at a new record management system, and because the fibers there, we have other choices of where to put the server, whether to do it in the cloud, um, how it how we, a lot of things connect to their vehicles and the ambulances. Mm. You know sure how they all carry the ambulances right. come in, and they uh, even when they go to the hospital, they they go right on the internet. So it's hard to separate your the fiber from the internet, but that's when you bring those two things together, you you can choose different options. So if that can addresses I, public safety a yeah. little. Can I give an example? Yeah, uh, and we not it's not we're not there yet, but uh, uh, Falmouth High School inside the building we have cameras, and. Um, we have the capacity now, I'm, I'm not saying we have it in place, but we have the capacity with our buildings being connected that if something catastrophic happened at Falmouth High School, let's say we had an intruder, Columbine or whatever, um, the police, if we want, if we set it, we could set it up so the police can see in, through our video system, so all over the fiber network, they can go into the high school through then the video system at the high school and see what's going on. In real time. In real time. They well, could. now I'm glad you mentioned cameras because you talked about the you asked before about the amount of data. What data? Well, I didn't I, cameras. We have cameras at the Woods Hole Dock. We have cameras at the Harbor Master. Um, we have cameras that look down where the ferry comes in, and uh, the Harbor Master can sit in his office and see what's happening at the Woods Hole Dock because there's there's been issues there. What's happening when the ferry's coming in? There's cameras down at the docks to monitor the um, boats that are on those slips. And um, that, that data all comes over uh, the fiber. And I know that you, you and that's, count. And that's big, bigger data. Well, yeah. we keep it kind of small, but that's bigger data. Than sure, right. it's more than moving yeah, Word right. documents yeah. back right. and forth, for example. I know that reliability is important. And uh, the Open Cape Network actually crosses the Cape Cod Canal in two separate places along the train bridge and the Sagamore Bridge. And the reason for that is so that in the event of a severe storm or any other kind of catastrophe, the network doesn't go down. And I wonder, in the time that you've been connected, 
I'm sure you've been through some, we had some pretty serious storms this past winter, and you always have a couple of thunderstorms that could knock things out. Have you had any problems so far? Um, I, I would say the only problems we had is when we first put it up and we hadn't balanced everything properly. Mm. A growing um, pain. Yeah, a growing pain, but I think for the most part it's, it's monitored very well by um, our folks, our IT people, and by Cape Net. I think it's when, when we have a problem, they respond quickly. And that's part of our um, agreement. You know, we pay for the internet and they maintain the fiber, which is the, the I should say, the, the open cape fiber, they own that, but the additional uh, buildings that we strung ourselves. Right, the network that the, you created. The network, um, that we call them the laterals, those extra 11 laterals, we paid for the fiber and we paid for it to be strung. But because we we, our understanding is we purchase internet through that, so they, uh, Cape Net maintains that for us. So it's, but it is our fiber. <laughs> this is a good deal. A good deal. And when the internet goes down, people scramble. I, I remember a story you told me, Wendy, about before you were connected to the network and the internet went down in school, and, and what did the students say? Uh, I, my office is in, uh, was in the high school office, main office, and I was right next door to the assistant principal, and there was a young man in there kind of arguing, not arguing, but having a heated conversation with the assistant principal. How can we be in school? We have no internet. I mean, it was just classic. I sat in my office and just howled. Yeah, well, it was great. And not to mention that managing a network with all kinds of redundancy. We have wireless redundancy and um, et cetera is probably one of the most complicated things we do and probably the most important thing. And it's not just the fiber being strong, it's the switches and how it's programmed and uh, weighted and whatnot. And I'll tell a similar story. You can have, you know, the best PC, buy somebody the best PC, you can have the best software, uh, running on a server or whatever, but if you don't have a network, I think sitting in your office, you can't do that much. You can't get to the programs you want to run. You can't do your email. You can't pay your bills. So in that regard, you know, the network is the most important thing. But most people don't care. You know, they just want it to work. The end user just wants to know, I'm going to turn on my computer, it's going to start up quickly, I'm going to be on the internet, and I'm not going to have any problems. It's like you get in your car, you turn the key, you want, it to, you want it to go. You don't want to know all the stuff that's going on under the hood. So even though it's not very glamorous, I agree with Lynn, it's so important. It's like the backbone. It's that we call it the infrastructure. I mean, it is, it is the backbone of, of everything that we do. So the end user, they just want to push the button and, and go to town. So... You talked earlier about the Chromebooks and the students all connected. Could you give us a sense as to, at one time, how many students could be accessing the Internet at oh once? My oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. I mean, we're talking about thousands of students, right? Yeah, yeah we are now. Um, well, we couldn't have done thousands before. Obviously, sometimes it depends on what they're doing. Um, we used to um, block YouTube and all kinds of stuff because, well, I mean, I understand there's some content that's maybe not appropriate on YouTube. There's a lot of great content on YouTube. Right. And now we don't, we don't, we just, it's wide open, you know. I mean, we do have some ways of kind of shaping it so that kids can't kind of consume all the bandwidth. But um, I, I, don't even, I couldn't even tell you, Matt, before. I mean, it was, it was painful. And teachers were frustrated, and they, they would just kind of throw their hands up and say, well, you know what, I'll just do something different. You know, I'll just, and, they, and it worked for them, but they, you know, the kids missed out on the richness that the Internet has, so, and all the resources they could get, uh, you know, that they could bring in, like the videos. Um, we often talk about, well, what, you know, what, kids will say, well, why do I need to learn math? You know, where I've watched math teachers show a video even like they have a really cool videos, the math of football, you know, so during the fall, they'll show the math of football and it, it's like, okay, that's why you need to know math. And they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have access to the, the beautiful videos that are available on YouTube and we also use discovery streaming mm -hmm. and, and other resources like that. So I, I can't, I couldn't even tell you, but what I can tell you is we would never be able to do the Chromebook initiative and actually found with high school is a bring your own device school. So we allow kids 
you know, to um, to use their phones when when the teacher says so. They just can't pull them out and, and use them. But I used to I walk through the library. I'm amazed. Almost every student in there has either a laptop or a phone or an iPad. Or an, well, you know what? There aren't as many iPads. The really? kids are mostly carrying their laptops or they're using their phones. Mm -hmm. But again, that would not be possible <clears throat> if we didn't have the bandwidth. And I, I will say we've never come close to maxing out our bandwidth, and that's for all of our schools, all those Chromebooks and all those devices, that, and we, we're not ma come close to maxing it out. I'm glad you said that because as you were talking about the YouTube initiative and looking at all those videos, I did wonder if there were times that you would have to say, okay, we're going to shut it down today or we wouldn't be able to accommodate every student doing it at once. Since we went to CapeNet, we don't have to do that. Before that's CapeNet, great. we did. That's great. And the thing, we, we have to distinguish between the Internet and the network. Yeah. Right. Our network for us is we have two strands, all ours. We, we, that's as yes. big as can be connecting the building. As far as the Internet bandwidth goes, we just decided how much we wanted to pay for the town pays for 50 megabits and up and down you pay for 250. 250. Yeah. So if that, because the, that fiber sitting there with all those strands in it, right. if I decided I needed more and want to pay more, you know, I just tell them. <laughs> yeah. But right now we, we're, our, our 50 is plenty for us and your 250 is plenty for the schools. Right. But if we need more, it's, we don't have to do much. It just tell yeah. them, pay. <laughs> yeah. And one of the beautiful things, too, I'm sorry, is uh, just f so people understand, is that uh, the schools are actually get E-rate, uh, which is that basically we get 50% off of our, of our Internet. So we get this great bandwidth for a reasonable price. So it's, it's just, you know, it's karma for us. So. That's great. I do want to mention that, that you've recently retired from your position. But I do want to ask that as you, as you leave the schools in Falmouth, what do you expect will happen as a result in the future as a result of this kind of connectivity? Is the sky the limit? Yeah, and I'm actually excited to see how it, how it goes. I mean, one of the, I don't know if this doesn't sound good, but that's probably one of the reasons why I retired. I, I felt like they need, we need a new, a fresh uh, view of what we can do. Somebody new with fresh ideas and to come in and, and just to take it and just, you know, the sky's the limit, yeah. And I should also mention, Lynn, that you just retired from your job. And, and I, just, so I wonder, you know, looking down the road, what is going to happen in Falmouth as a result of this great connectivity? Well, I think all of the same and more. And I can honestly say in the last two years, I've been in Falmouth a long time, these are the things we've been waiting for. And, you know, we've been waiting for the Internet. Mm. We've been waiting for virtual servers. Um, we've been waiting to connect the buildings. And, and now we, we, we got it. And so I think exciting times are ahead. Anything we're looking to buy or purchase, we can do it. Right. You know, it's not, this isn't holding us back anymore. Right. It's great for the community. It's great for the businesses. And it's great for the people who live here. Right. I right. think, yeah, and because it's so embedded in what we're doing in the town and the school, I'm not sure they really know it because they may still have slower internet at their homes. But for the town and the school, we're really in good shape. That's terrific. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. This is called Falmouth, the Future of Connectivity. I'm Matt Ellison. Thanks so much for being with us.